Welcome to the one within all back to another episode of Interverse. And here we are at the uh, top of the summer right after the solstice. And really this time of year, people start to do all kinds of things that aren't as common at other times of year. I know myself, I go to a lot of music festivals, which you probably know about me if you've been listening for a while. And when I'm out there, I see people doing all kinds of things for fun that are also potentially difficulty causing situations. And today we got an expert in integration with us by the name of Peter Conley. And we're going to be discussing psychedelic fallout and how to minimize the fallout and maximize the transformation of our experiences. And I know for myself that some psychedelic experiences I've had in the past actually took years before I finally kind of put the pieces together and figured out what was going on with me there. So while we're not recommending people do or not do psychedelics, we are going to be discussing these very powerful transformative tools, but the actual practices of integration will be able to be applied to anything in our life that is a big ground shaking experience. So you can find Peter's website, integration-station.com, in the show notes where you can find resources as someone that's had psychedelic experiences and looking to find a way to maximize the benefits of that. You can find resources for that and also resources for clinics that are utilizing psychedelics like ketamine therapy or other types of, you know, some states actually have psilocybin legal now. So there's a lot of uh, change in the air in the psychedelic landscape. And I think that there's probably going to be new clinics opening up left and right. So if you know about these type of uh, people that are doing this type of work, it would be great to pass them along to Peter's website, Integration Station, where there is a ton of supplements that will help you, supplementary materials uh, in terms of music you might use, practices that you could get into coaching modalities. There's so much. So Peter's going to help us understand all these step-by-steps and also give us some uh, stories about his own journey, what led him to want to do this type of work. Work that I highly support because there is a lot of, as I mentioned, people are going to be doing things for fun and sometimes psychedelics are treated that way. And a lot of times those people don't know what they're opening up into. And these things, in my opinion, are like reality shifting devices that you step through this portal in your imagination, you might come out an entirely different self and an entirely different universe. And it's up to you to drive and direct that experience and also to manage the recovery after that experience so that we get the greatest good out of it. And we don't find ourselves somewhere worse or uh, attached or addicted or all kinds of potential ramifications. It's a, it's an infinity out there. So both good and bad are available. And Peter's got the tools to help us navigate these choppy waters, sometimes choppy, sometimes smooth. And uh, go ahead and welcome you to the show, man. Thanks for being here. What's up? Thanks for having me on. Doing pretty well. Yeah. So do you want to introduce yourself a little more? Is there anything I missed about kind of going over what you're about and what you are doing in your work? You nailed the overview of my project, so thanks for doing that and doing your homework. But I guess I'll, I'll give this chance to uh, introduce myself and kind of lay out my story and how this project came to be. Please so do, I, yeah. That sounds great. My name is Peter. I grew up in a suburb outside of Buffalo, New York. Lived in Western New York for the majority of my life. Uh, pretty typical upbringing. Just had one sibling, mom and dad. Father was an entrepreneur. Uh, had a really good high school experience. Went to a state college called SUNY Geneseo, about an hour outside of Buffalo, New York. But it was a pretty typical life for the first 22 years of my life. Like thought I was going to take over the family business. Thought I would marry someone from high school. Um, very, very typical um, and very cookie cutter, I like to say. But my, my story and my life kind of got expanded due to mental health issues. So I've struggled with depression and anxiety for a long time, dating earlier back to my teenage years. My uh, father actually passed away in 2009 from a lung disease called pulmonary fibrosis. Um, 
grew up with an alcoholic sibling, experienced pretty extreme bullying when I was younger, had physical abuse from a grandparent. So there was a lot of trauma there that started to percolate and, and kind of rise to the surface in my early teenage years, but really hit ahead in my early 20s, call it 22, 23. So like I said, I had a pretty typical college experience uh, and high school experience, but things started to bubble to the surface around 22, 23. So I did the typical thing of getting into talk therapy and tried some medications, but that really didn't move the needle for me. So in the summer of uh, 2013, I was on a backpacking trip in Peru with some close friends. And I've heard at the time, heard about this thing called ayahuasca. And I think maybe it was Tim Ferriss at the time described it as two decades of psychotherapy in a night. So that uh, kind of sold me on it. And I, I foolishly signed up for a, a uh, retreat of ayahuasca, not having any experience with altered states of consciousness. Literally never minute meditation, no breath work done, nothing. So um, I say foolishly because ayahuasca is one of the most powerful tools in the toolkit. And if you're not familiar with altered states of consciousness, it is quite the experience. If you spend your whole life attached to your ego, it's jumping in the deep end without having swimming lessons. Um, so I went down, was backpacking with some friends, and then peer, peeled off to do my own thing to this retreat and uh, signed up for three sessions. It was a week long, you know, it was full fledged retreat where they had housing, food, music, and all that. Uh, I think the name of the, the retreat was called Melissa Wazi down in the Sacred Valley of uh, Peru outside of PSAC. Um, and so, Went into the first ceremony really not knowing what to expect. Um, I remember begin, being given the cup from a shaman, thinking that's really a lot. <laughs> like, didn't ask for less, but was given a very full cup. Drank it, went back to my side of the circle. Uh, and, and within 20 to 30 minutes, it started to hit me. And I remember uh, fighting the experience. I remember asking, my intention was to cure my depression at the time. And I asked for it, and I got what I asked for. for um, for better or for worse. So sat back down to my edge of the circle, started seeing visualizations, sacred geometry, and, and then the, the work, as I put in, started to hit me. I, I started to feel deep emotions of depression, sadness, anger, guilt bubble up to the surface and visions of red and, and just extreme discomfort. And at that moment, started to reject the medicine, just fighting it, not surrendering to it, not focusing on my breath, just doing what you're not supposed to do. And I remember this back and forth went on for about two or three hours where I was just in this purgatory of not letting go. And finally the shaman uh, in the middle of the night called for a second round of, of the ceremony. And I'm like, this is what I'm here for. I guess I'll do it again. Went up to get my second cup, went back, back to my area of the circle. And then finally I had enough where it just overtook me. I remember, uh, Purging started and my consciousness traveled from you know, the back of my head where my eyes are down into the, into the bucket. And then I was in this void for God knows how many hours, um, completely lost attachment to my ego and was very uncomfortable with the experience. Finally started to come back to within hours, you know, dead of night, probably 3 a.m., 4 a.m. And remember feeling really, really raw, feeling like I just did a lot of work and like I just exerted a lot of effort, uh, but just feeling very, very raw. And so the ceremony closes. Um, we go back to our rooms in the retreat and I just sleep for hours. Um, uh, we get back up and have a little integration talk and talk about our experiences. And I remember just feeling that rawness, just completely out of it, just kind of regretting being there. Um, then we took a day off. I think we walked around the Sacred Valley and PSAC, and then we had our second ceremony on day three. So it was day one ceremony, day two we had off, day three of ceremony. And I remember going back into it, uh, you know, this is what I signed up for, and just being very reluctant to do it. Uh, Can I pause you before we go into day three? Yeah. I want to ask a few questions about day one before we, I don't want to scoot past it too fast, right? Yeah. Yeah, so in that, you said that you... We're having trouble letting go and maybe accepting the work that the medicine was going to do for you. 
I myself have never done ayahuasca, but I have heard that it's like the, one of the strongest tools in the toolkit for sure. And that without the right guides, it could be uh, without the right shamanic help, especially doing things on the energetic astral level on your behalf, it could potentially be more difficult than helpful as a, as a medicine, right? So I've experienced resisting a medicine journey before myself and just that purgatory state, that was the word you used. I feel like that's such a strong, um, perfect illustration of the scenario because maybe when you're in that state, maybe you'll see if you agree with me, but it's actually showing you the pattern of your whole life in that moment of not being able to let go uh, not being able to accept the light, if you will, not let, hiding from the light. That's what it felt like whenever you said that your consciousness went into this void, went into the bucket. It's like hiding from the light in a way uh, that is trying to get through the cracks of your armor and, and help bring about the transformation you needed. So I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on how that getting that stuck feeling on the first day maybe pertains to what your depression, what your psychological state was like going through life up to that point. Was there, was it like a, a mirroring you think, or was it just too unfamiliar of an experience? And that's what brought about the, uh, the difficulty. I think it was too unfamiliar of an experience that brought about the difficulty. Like I mentioned, I, at that moment, I had no experience with altered states of consciousness, not even the simplest meditation, not even the simplest breath work, um, no lighter psychedelic use like MDMA or um, psilocybin at that point. It just, it was so foreign to me and so intense. It just brought about such an extreme discomfort. Cool. Well, <laughs> cool. Not exactly cool. It's very uncomfortable, I'm sure, but. Yeah, that kind of answers my question. And do you think that people should, in retrospect, give the simpler, easier tools some work before going to the break glass in case of emergency option? That's an awesome question. There are plenty of people I follow online that have done ayahuasca as their first foray into psychedelics and have been fine and have produced amazing results. I was not in that camp. Um, I'm definitely from that experience i'm definitely on the conservative side of using any tool especially if it's even just like holotropic breath work if you sign up for a, a weekend seminar and you're unaware of your trauma that can shake some things loose so using a tool as simple as that so i'm in the camp of um learning to paddle or learning getting a swimming lesson first to pose a dry, diving in the deep end and some things that um what that may look like is Vipassana meditation, uh, static dance, some types of breath work, I think are good starter points because you're always accessible and you're a lot less likely to get in the deep water uh, using those things. So that's my opinion. There's plenty of other opinions out there and plenty of people who have had positive, amazing, transformative experiences jumping into ayahuasca first, but I clearly was not one of them. Okay, that's, uh, yeah, I could definitely relate to jumping in too deep on some things before in my past and also having good experiences on the first round of certain things. But I tend to agree some of those lighter tools might be good to start with. I mean, you can sort of blast off just from moving your body in the right way with the right breath if you know certain techniques. And the difference with that is the feeling is over much more quickly and you don't feel like a loss of control. And at a point, we do need to maybe let go of that feeling of I'm in charge, I'm in control. That's part of the letting go and surrendering to the flow of what is, of nature, of the Tao. But that is not something that uh, an ego who has no experience in letting go and going with the flow uh, should be able to do easily. It's like, how could you expect somebody to necessarily have that skill if they've never even practiced it at all so yeah it's a it's a tricky situation you found yourself in sounds like and then you came in for an, another day on day three as you were about to tell us about yeah day three 
Um, it was, you know, part of a three day ceremony in a week was still there and decided to go round two at it. Um, same deal. Chom and field of my cup pretty heavily. Um, go back to my area in the circle, same, uh, sensations and visualizations of discomfort starting to rise to the surface, but this time I completely reject it. I am just like, nope, this is it. I don't want this. Um, started and because I was so in the medicine, so intoxicated, I could barely walk at this point. So I like army crawled outside of the hut and sat in the, there's this, um, like not a waiting room, but a long hallway into the actual hut, which I just laid on, um, and was pretty much unresponsive. The shaman came out to talk to me, couldn't articulate language. Um, his wife came out to talk to me, just refused to go back in and do the work. And was just laying there for the rest of the ceremony, which was four or five hours at that point. And they're just in and out of reality. Couldn't really remember too much from that, from those four or five hours. Just remember pretty extreme discomfort and wanting it to be over as quick as possible. So that was my second round. Didn't do it day three. Um, retreated back to my bed and was pretty, um, not unresponsive, but was very uh, antisocial from that moment on. And I remember on day four, I started to lose my short, short-term memory. Forgot why I was in Peru. Um, couldn't remember who I came with. Just gaps in my knowledge. Um, finally came back in about a day on day five, but was just in really rough shape after rejecting the medicine. And I was supposed to, I had plans on uh, backpacking further throughout South America at that time. But I remember jumping on a Zoom call or a Skype call at the time with my brother. And he's like, and just told him about the experience. And he's like, you should just come home. <laughs> I think it's about time, you, you know, you, you had your experiences, you enjoyed the backpacking, just come on home. Um, and so I, uh, after that, just didn't do day three ceremony. We stayed the rest of the time in the retreat, just kind of to myself and uh, charted my bus back to Lima, Peru, and then my plane back to the States and got back home. And then within two weeks, I fell into a deep depression. Um, luckily there was a delay. I, I didn't get hit with it while down there because it would made, would have made traveling really, really hard, but it was, um, had suicide ideation, couldn't really get out of the bed, was just in this dark hole and spent the next six months, um, trying the more gentle tools outside of, in addition to talk therapy and medication to get me back on my feet. And that looked like acupuncture started meditating for the first time, um, I think those were the main two that I used. Didn't try breathwork at the time, but started to expand my toolkit um, beyond just the standard, you know, Western American approach. And it took me about six months, but finally got into a good place. Um, was depression was not cured, but not at the forefront. And um, yeah, and just kind of started to live my life again. And that was my first foray in psychedelics, just jumping in the deep end, having done ayahuasca twice and taking me about six months to kind of repair the damage. There was no, I didn't even know the word integration existed. I, I, I wasn't aware of all these other milder tools. I didn't understand um, concept of altered states of consciousness. I really didn't understand attachment to ego and all these other things that help you navigate those experiences. So pretty much jumped in the deep end, was drowning and got myself out. Um, fast forward. So that was 2013. Um, fast forward about two years and I started to really just expand my toolkit. I signed up for my first, um, 10 day Vipassana retreat, which is a silent meditation retreat run by, uh, the Dharma org, um, amazing organization. I did that out in Owen, Alaska, Washington, which is outside of Mount St. Helens, about an hour and a half away from Portland, Oregon. And started to deepen my practice. Did that for 10 days and and uh, walked out of it with a new tool in my toolkit and continue to do Vipassana to this day. And so that Can was I just back you of- up again. I want to back up onto the sort of the uh, return home after that first big reality shattering experience. And yeah. you said that you got into acupuncture and meditation it's not hard to imagine how you might have come across meditation or have already been aware of it, but what led you into acupuncture and what was that like? I'm curious about it as a modality and something I want to have a whole episode about soon, but I don't know a lot about it other than 
the basics. What was that like and how helpful was it? What were you like? You know, you mentioned the, the depression and stuff, but what, and the suicidal ideations, but what, how, how long did that last? Like, what was the, this was more severe than you had ever experienced before. Is that true? It made it worse. Correct. Yeah. It made it worse. It was more severe than I ever experienced before. Um, to be honest, I, I don't, I don't really remember what got me into acupuncture, maybe beyond the fact that I was open to try anything because I, I felt like I was in such a hole and I knew, or at least I felt that the antidepressants and the talk therapy just wasn't moving the needle enough. Like it helped. And I'm not trying to disparage those therapeutic modalities, but I just knew I needed something else. Um, so meditation, I signed up to the Shambhala Center, Shambhala Center here in Buffalo. And I think it was general mindfulness. I forgot the exact type of meditation, but as far as the acupuncture, um, can't really remember why. I just remember Googling different providers and I found this lady who's been practicing for three or four decades. And in terms of what that was like, I remember being really calming. I remember not being able to articulate what shifted, but after going into several sessions, I remember something felt lighter in me after doing the acupuncture. And I couldn't tell you, I mean, it's been eight years, so it's hard to hone in on what she focused on or what was the exact procedure. But I just remember thinking, hey, I think that worked. And I remember just thinking like, why... I grew up in an Irish Catholic family, pretty traditional. And it's, it's always been, the answers are anti SSRIs, uh, anti-anxiety meds or anti therapy. There was really no, uh, but those, that was the toolkit that was uh, expressed to me as what you should do. And I remember coming out of acupuncture saying, like, why isn't this talked about more? It, it just seemed to give me such relief that, um, it seems like a tool that should be in other people's toolkits. Yeah. I'm really curious about it. I need to give it a shot myself. I've never experienced it, but to me, I've heard, I've read books on it actually. And uh, some of the things that are cap are possible with acupuncture are just mind blowing. Like I've heard about people with ghost limb syndrome where they're like missing an arm and or a leg or something. And they feel like itchy where their arm used to be or some kind of nerve reaction going on that makes them think like they're feeling that limb, even though it's gone. And that acupuncturists can use the needle in the air, in the space where the point should have be if the limb was still there and actually cause those feelings and that discomfort to dissipate as if they're doing something to a physical body part. And it just, the more I learn about it, the more it seems like there's a really strong energetic blueprint that is actually what our physical body grows out of like a scaffolding and that no matter what's going on with the physical body, that blueprint can be, um, I don't know, tweaked isn't the right word, but like refined or uh, healed or in some way, it's almost like your deepest core self image, your soul level self image. And even if you've lost a finger or a hand or whatever, that it's still there on your blueprint level and can be worked with on that energetic level. So it's really a fascinating modality. I'm glad that that was able to give you some relief. And my other question about after the acupuncture was the, it took a few years to lead into more, to find more tools, if I'm not mistaken from what you said, but was the extreme aspect of the, depression still there those whole next couple of years or yeah it well, so you got so some relief maybe from acupuncture it, the extreme wasn't there um but it, it was at the beginning it was really bad but you were able to kind of do some balancing but you needed more if that if i'm not mistaken correct. yeah there's some underlying sadness there that persisted for years hence getting into the boston meditation um, and just a general unhappiness with some habits that I was trying, that I was trying to phase out, but the major depression and suicidal ideation that really cured up, uh, or dissipated after six months of talk therapy, medication, meditation, and acupuncture back in 2013. So luckily I, I was able to really get myself out of that hole 
but still had this underlying sadness, anxiety, and habits that persisted um, after that experience. Cool. All right. Well, I'm happy to let you continue on with the the tale. I'm enjoying it. I just like to pause and draw out certain elements that I, I find interesting here because there's so much to this whole tapestry. Of course. Um, yeah, and feel free to stop me with any questions you have just to fill in the holes. So the Vipassana meditation retreat um, was in March 2015. And that definitely moved the needle for me. And it was a great tool that I still use to this day. Um, and I continued just to try different things like EMDR, which is a way to treat trauma. Are you familiar with EMDR? EMDR stands for what? I move, I'm going to butcher it. I movement, something, something. Um, effectively, it's um, a type of therapy. There's different ways to... Um, conduct it the way I've used it is you're given two joysticks. They look like joysticks that vibrate and they're supposed to break up unconscious patterns. So it looks like you're two, holding two joysticks and it, and they vibrate on different um, frequencies and it's supposed to resurface repress memories. And you're doing this with a therapist uh, at the time. So try that um, static dance. Was that, uh, was that one very effective EMDR? Not too much. That's a new one to me. Didn't seem to really resonate too well. No, it didn't for whatever reason. Um, I'm not going to knock it because I've heard, I've had friends that have swear by it, but for whatever reason, it didn't really move the needle too much for me. Yeah. Not everything is for everybody or for every situation, right? Or the right time. Or the right time. Oh, it stands for eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing. Cool. Um, So try that. And then, uh, f- fast forward to I don't know, 2019 been trying these different tools it helped a little bit but still had um, the underlying sadness and depression and throughout this time I've been listening to plenty of podcasts like the Aubrey Marcus show, Tim Ferriss um, Kyle Kingsbury on it um, things of that realm and all these people that I follow online they're wealthier fitter, more well read just keep talking about psychedelics as a tool. And I had such an aversion to them because of ayahuasca, obviously what happened to me, you know, in in 2013. Um, But more of these compounds started to be talked about and the the different applications like uh, MDMA being used to treat PTSD. And that's those studies coming out of MAPS, the the nonprofit, the multi- I'm going to butcher it. The multidisciplinary association Academy for psychedelic studies. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. You got it. Um, and just hearing with Doblin, the founder talk about it on podcasts, it just made me warm up to the idea that these compounds aren't all bad and there is, um, substance to them and efficacy and yes, they're extremely potent, but used in with the right set and setting used with the right facilitator. You shouldn't throw out these tools completely just because of my experience. So uh, about a year and a half ago, I tried ketamine therapy, um, which is legal in the States. It's one of, it is, it's the only legal psychedelic or quasi psychedelic currently. Although MDMA is on pace to be legal and available to the public within, by 2023. Um, so I tried ketamine therapy and had amazing results from it. Just the underlying sadness that was there for years that was persisted, just gone did six sessions, um, did it intramuscularly where they hook you up to an ID done with the doctor overseed. Um, takes about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, I did it at a medical office here in, here in Buffalo, um, and took about four to six weeks to kick in, but I, it felt like it reset something in my brain where those negative thought, uh, thought patterns and the sadness just melted away. Um, and then I'm like, oh shit, I'm a believer. Like this is, these tools clearly work well when done right. And also having um, experience with meditation under my belt at that point made it easier to navigate that ketamine therapy opposed to jumping into the deep end with ayahuasca. And so got more interested in all these other compounds and, and what they can do and started listening more to Rick Doblin and all the people putting out kind of like Dr. Robert Carhart Harris um, out of Imperial College of London and just really under, trying to understand where the puck is going and what 
compounds can be used to help heal. And so the the theme that I kept, so I, I, I had an idea also that I wanted to build an online business and provide value and build something uh, in the space that helped me so much. And I, I've seen um, projects like Psychedelics Today and The Third Wave, you know, they've existed for years and are doing amazing work. And I'm like, okay, so awareness is kind of covered. Um, microdosing is covered by the third wave. Like, what can I build that people need um, that has yet to be created in space? And I just remember hearing over and over from all the, the people, the, the leaders in the space, it's like integration is so important, integration, integration, over and over. And I feel like that's kind of an underserved area and hard to define. So like, okay, let's study this and understand it better. And I can apply it to more ketamine therapy and I can help build out this resource up for people looking to integrate their psychedelic experiences. So hence that born, uh, that was the birth of integration station where I'm collecting different resources to one, define the process and then to provide tools for the integration process of psychedelics. Whether that's you're doing ayahuasca down in South America, whether you're doing psilocybin therapy down in Jamaica and micro meditations or out in the nether Netherlands and at uh, synesthesia, they have a clinic that's legal there. Um, and also just building out for the future. All these ketamine clinics that are in the United States, a lot of them will bring on MDMA when it's legal in about two years. So just trying to provide as much resources and content uh, to help both clinics and individuals using these compounds. Wow, we got a lot to unpack with uh, <laughs> all of this. And before we start talking about the integration techniques, maybe we should see what we can do on discussing some of these things individually. Like, first of all, ketamine, that's an interesting one. I have no experience with it myself other than witnessing people do it. And the thing that I've seen about it is, A, people tend to take it uh, up the nose like Coke use, which I think is probably problematic. And secondly, I've seen a lot of addictive behavior with people on ketamine and also overuse to the point where, well, I just don't understand the recreational side of things like this. Like I, if I'm, if I'm somewhere doing something interesting and fun, that's very different than my normal day, like watching a concert or something. I'm pretty happy to do that in my generally normal state of consciousness or of if altered, very lightly altered with maybe some cannabis or something. But what I wonder what leads people into sort of the dark side of that particular substance, whereas, or what makes it addictive where something like MDMA doesn't really have that type of quality to it. I doubt anyone's getting addicted to ayahuasca probably because it seems so challenging. I'm not sure, but let's talk a little bit more about uh, ketamine, its origins. Um, I know that there's a lot of stuff from the guy who invented the flotation tanks. I'm blanking on his name, uh, Lily, right? John Lilly. John Lilly. So what can you tell us more about this uh, particular tool and uh, the pros and the cons and like what, where it's available, what states yeah. it's uh, possible to do this. Not terribly well versed in this, but I'll give it my best shot. Um, ketamine is, I think it's labeled as a disassociative and has been used also as an anesthetic. Um, I forgot when it's been synthesized, but it's clearly a synthetic compound. Um, it's been used to treat depression for at least over a decade. Um, and it, and there's two ways and two applications of it. You can use a, a mouth lozenge where it's a slow release lozenge you put in here and you talk to a therapist at that time while under the influence of ketamine. And then the second approach is what I did, the intramuscular uh, approach or IM, where they hook you up to an IDE. It's a slow drip. It takes you into a K-hole and you lose your ability to, to move and use language. And it's pretty much a reboot of, of your, your brain um, completely. And pretty much a lot of wellness clinics have them. I went to a place called Own Wellness here in Buffalo. It also has um, homeopathic modalities, yoga, and things of that nature. It's not covered by insurance yet, so it's a, definitely a higher ticket item and, and more in the like luxury kinds of therapies. But there's, I think, over a thousand ketamine clinics across the United States. 
There's some clinics that are solely ketamine based, like uh, Field Trip Health, which is based out of Toronto. And they have a couple of US locations popping up recently. There's also um, Mind Bloom Health based out of New York City. So there are clinics purely based on psychedelics, which those two I mentioned, I'm pretty sure are planning to move into MDMA as well. But in terms of uh, access, if you're in a major city, I'm almost guaranteed you're going to be able to find a kind of plant. Very interesting, too, about the idea of rebooting the mind or rebooting the brain. I've worked in IT a lot in my life, and that's usually the first thing you do if something's not functioning correctly. Turn it off and turn it back on. So maybe there's something uh, useful about that with our consciousness as well. But I'll maybe detail some of the things that I have in mind, but I wanted to shoot this question at you first. Do you see any problems with a simple clinical approach or maybe kind of a materialist approach to this type of medicine? Uh, Is there a deeper spiritual component here that is overlooked sometimes in your experience? Or do you think most practitioners, even coming from a credentialed university scenario, do understand beyond just the material aspect and the mechanistic combination of a chemical hitting brain cells that there might be something more to it. Yeah, I think there, I've only been to one clinic, but uh, I'm going to make some assumptions that there definitely are some gaps in knowledge of the medical based practitioners using this as a tool that don't understand altered states of consciousness and don't understand the integration process. Luckily, the, the clinic I went to, I got paired with an integration coach um, who's also a psychologist, who's also aware of MDMA being used as tools and generally aware of psychedelics and altered states of consciousness. So she had experience there and was able to help me work through what came up. Um, but I 100% can foresee some of these clinics coming online and purely approaching it from a Western medicine uh, approach and not working with integration coaches and not understanding um, exactly what an altered state of consciousness is and how ketamine therapy can be similar to breath work or meditation and how those other tools are interrelated. So I, I can definitely see s- some, not all of these centers missing some of the secret sauce as to what percent. I don't know, but I, I can see if they don't, have that base understanding of altered states of consciousness, there could be something missing. Yeah, this is where I would throw up red flags for people to look for is that type of, uh, you know, you would want to scout out who you're going to do this type of therapy with, probably have like several conversations with them, I would think, before even going into that place because you're going into a pretty vulnerable, programmable state, especially in the K-hole as they call it with uh, something with other modalities like MDMA therapy, you don't lose control of yourself in that same way. Like we can talk more about MDMA specifically, but some of the elements that I have uh, red flag warnings about with this type of clinical approach to psychedelics would be to find out if the practitioner is aware that plants have spirits and that medicine has a spirit too. So not only would a plant medicine have a spirit attached to it that's connected with that plant, and the shamans in South America definitely know this very well because they go on fasting regimens where they only eat one plant, like, and they just communicate with that thing. And we we've lost the plot on this in the West because we eat fifty eight different things in a week, and we have no idea how one thing affects us versus how another thing affects us. It's all just one big mix. So we'd want to. Be aware of that going in and that even a substance, if it's like a refined, is far from the original plant, it also has a spirit attached to it too in a strange way. Like I remember John Lilly talking about since at the time that he was doing it, ketamine was pretty underutilized by humans. Uh, That it was kind of like a big open void space, like an office building with nobody moved in there as a metaphor. And So we want to be aware of that and maybe call in and work with the plant spirits purposefully, not um, ignore them. (laughs) That could be something useful. And then the other really big aspect of this is that 
psychedelic use, I've witnessed it uh, when I got more open to seeing things like aura and understanding non-physical realms that people's heavy usage of some of these things in a recreational way, you might say, can like burn a hole in their aura more or less and create weaknesses in the field. And this might have even been some to some degree what could have been going on with your experience with that first big ayahuasca round, not being stable enough on the inside to to hold all that energy and light. And it's just like sort of boring gaps into your your bioplasmic sheath. And what happens with these openings is it's actually pathways for non-physical entities to hop in or get a ride, unwanted passengers. So I was wondering if you, and I want to talk more about, about the different types of attachments versus even alter personalities within ourselves that aren't an external thing, but it's something we've created in ourselves. But I wanted to check in with you on, on that concept, if it's anything you've heard discussed or seen yourself having to do with entities that were of a spiritual nature, piggybacking in with the psychedelic medicine, or sometimes the medicine might help you identify them and release them. But I was just wondering what your thoughts are on this as a phenomenon, as a possible risk factor. And I bring it up back to the red flags with practitioners, because I would want a practitioner even if I was just doing talk therapy to know about the potential of this potent, this type of arrangement with spirit that can usually not, it's usually not great to have something attached, attached to you. High level guides won't attach or try to get in you. They will never violate your free will like that. So I wonder, yeah. What are your thoughts on this as a subject matter? Yeah. I, I think psychedelics definitely open up a portal into your soul and make it easier to influence it and kind of take down your um, defenses at that point and certainly make you more susceptible to all kinds of energies um, that can stick with you if they're not pro properly processed or, or purged. I, I personally haven't, in my work, I haven't delved too much into understanding, researching, reading about entities. So that's a little bit foreign to me, but definitely the concept of you, your soul being more exposed while using psychedelics is something I believe and should be taken, shouldn't be taken lightly. And that when you're looking for a facilitator, they should have the utmost character and respect and understanding of what you're dealing with because you're in such a vulnerable state, whether that be ketamine, whether that be ayahuasca, even holotropic breath work, like you definitely want to seek out facilitators who understand what could go wrong, understand how vulnerable you are and preferably have done these modalities themselves. Yeah, very interesting. I'm a, another side of this would be alternate personalities we can have within ourselves, or a clinical term for it is ego states, although they're not the same thing. Alter personalities and ego states are a little different. Alter personalities would be like more of a multiple personalities disorder type of situation where ego states are more like containers for memories we want to block from our conscious mind and experiences or feelings. So I've been reading this book called Soul Centered Healing by Dr. Tom Zisner. And I recommend this book to anybody who was also recently on the Higher Side Chats. Really interesting guy who had been specifically working with people with the multiple personality disorder. And he dove deep into trying to understand what are ego states, what are alter personalities, and I think very possibly what's being integrated when we do have a medicinal journey with plants, like what we've been discussing today is that it could be these fragmented shamans call this soul retrieval, actually fragmented aspects of our soul or self that have been kept separate and put in a box, if you will. And we're trying to bring those back to consciousness and bring them back into the light so that they can, that part of ourself can heal. And so an ego state would be like, say something happened to you, say you're four years old and you're outside playing and a dog, a neighbor's dog just came out of nowhere and attacked you as a four-year-old. And then 
later in life, you're say 34 and uh, you are just talking to somebody on the sidewalk and all of a sudden you start to feel a panic, like you need to get away and you don't know what's wrong and you're freaking out inside and you're trying to keep it together. And out of the corner of your eye, there's somebody walking their dog down the sidewalk and you have no idea that it's actually a four-year-old version of yourself that is holding on to all the pain and fear and trauma of being attacked by a dog at that age that is reacting to seeing another dog right then and there. And you don't even remember that that happened to you when you're four. And so this is what I mean by like ego states. And I think especially I was already kind of familiar with the idea, but after reading Tom's book, it seems really clear that we're probably all carrying an entire household of ego states of different times, different versions of ourselves where we had to lock away a difficult feeling or experience. And the downside of that is that four-year-old you also had some positive qualities that are also locked up in that cage. And so the integration process is not only healing the trauma and releasing the fear and the pain, but it's also bringing back into your awareness something that could be very positive, like the innocence or the joy of being a four-year-old. For me, psychedelic use helped me integrate and bring back eight-year-old me that liked to draw or whatever age, and now I'm kind of generalizing, but I remember a specific psychedelic experience I had where it all hit me at once that I used to love to create art. This was in my mid twenties, early twenties when this happened and uh, that I had stopped, not only stopped making art, but also had created the story of myself that I'm not creative. And it was all to deal with the fear of rejection and the uh, pain of losing access to the time and uh, resources to freely create art. And so I used, I've done this about multiple things in my life as well, like making music used to be in a band all through high school. It was an awesome band. And then we went our separate ways for college. And I like put that version of myself on the shelf and said, I don't make music anymore because I don't have time or whatever. When in reality, it took me years to figure this out. I was actually so sad about the band breaking up and sort of traumatized by losing that really important part of my life that I created a story that I didn't deserve it anymore. And that, and I didn't know that that was my story until I finally found 18 year old version of me deep inside and made contact with that being and was like, what are you about? Why are you here? And so distinct. And so this is what I think a big part of integration has to deal with is bringing back pieces of our self into the main self and keeping them from just being trapped in a, a perpetual loop of a negative self-belief, if you will. 100% agree. I think trauma goes overlooked and how that can create fractures in our psyche and those versions of self, whether that be 18 year old or four year old, or for me, it was the 13 year old version of me who got bullied pretty heavily. Um, can become stuck, lodgings, and just kind of um, disintegrated from our entire psyche. So totally agree that's something that psychedelics can help. And our issues of um, mental health is when you're not fully integrated because of those wounds. Yeah. <laughs> I think that that's a big part of it is finding these other versions of ourselves and like putting them back in their place and embracing all the gifts that they had at that time. Or I say they, the reason I say they is because as I understand it, these ego states that we can leave behind in our past are actually in the psychic or astral realm as thought forms, individuated conscious beings. And so integration is a good word, but we have to also maybe avoid the idea that we're dissolving them or like merging them with the ego in a sense when they blend with the ego is when their particular trauma takes over the conscious mind in an irrational way. So in an integrative sense, what it is is that we're leaving them, we're letting them continue to exist, but we're recognizing that they exist and helping that part of ourselves leave 
the fear moment behind and go somewhere else. Because like to the example of you as a 13 year old being bullied, if you had an ego state of that age of yourself, it's like there's a psychic realm version of you that's in, like you said at the beginning, a type of purgatory state where every day is the day where you're getting bullied as a 13 year old and everything like you could in, in hypnosis, this Tom Zisner guy would talk to his clients and actually talk to their ego states directly. And this ego state of 13 year old would be like, yeah, I'm at school. There's uh, this poster on the wall. I'm wearing these clothes. Like everything about that world was like a parallel universe that was completely real to that ego state. And that's just how powerful trauma is and the splintering of our psyche can be. And just think how much psychic energy it takes to maintain that bubble of separation and shove an entire year of our life or month of our life into that spot. Like there's so much, it's a, it's a really big deal. And I think that's why integration is so important. I'm looking forward to in the second hour, getting into the uh, actual techniques and processes that you're offering at the website. I want to say we've got about 10 minutes, eight to 10 minutes in the first hour. So uh, maybe this would be, I mean, if you have more response to this ego state question, it's just what I'm focused on lately because of reading this book and it's fascinating, but we could also get into how people can connect with you, how they can work with you. Well, we can get into the specific resources more deeply in hour two, but maybe we should focus on what integration station is all about, um, how people can access that and who it's for. Yeah. Okay. So integration station is for anyone looking to integrate a psychedelic experience that could be coming out of a 10 day Vipassana retreat that could be coming off of a weekend long holotropic breathwork seminar that could be coming back from Peru because you did ayahuasca or doing MDMA assisted psychotherapy doesn't really matter the modality and trying to build it out and provide resources for anyone trying to integrate these experiences. Cool. So uh, what, what's the website like? What do you, what's on there? How do, how might they, what are, what are they going to look for when they navigate it? Yeah. So there's um, kind of three main arms. Um, one articles, just blog posts that I'm writing about different topics to a process page that is breaking down the, entire process of integration and then three a resource hub that includes different books you can read to understand the process better to understand trauma better to understand the psychedelic revolution better um building out a coaching resource so if you're looking to be coached after a psychedelic experience you can hire someone directly to the website um journaling practices there's a free email autoresponder that if you submit your email you'll get um about a week long of journaling prompts to help you work through psychedelic experience and also my uh, modalities page, which is probably the most robust, which lists about 20 or so different modalities that can pair well with a psychedelic experience. For example, that could be like using EMDR, like I mentioned, the eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy with something like MDMA therapy. I think Rick, no, was it Rick Dabo? I forgot who mentioned those two typically pair really, really well for trying to heal trauma. Could be trying a different type of meditation with ketamine therapy. Could be trying a static dance with um, your after your ayahuasca ceremony. Really, just a list of tools to help extend that process to keep that window in your psyche open and to help process more trauma. Very cool. Sounds like they got all kinds of things to keep them busy if they visit your site, and a lot of these tools will be useful in conjunction with practices like you said, like breath work that don't have to be involving taking in a substance at all. So I like, I like your, I agree with your take that it's not like, we're not recommending the use of these substances, but we're being realistic that people are using them and will continue to use them more. And that like any, any tool, it's got a right way and a wrong way to use it. And also there's a more than just the moment of when you're in it, but everything that follows that that has a lot of relevance to where you're going to go next because any type of therapy can help shift your energy. Like I do tuning fork work with people and with myself sometimes, and you can get a lot of stuff unstuck using powerful tools, 
and reshape your psychic landscape. But if your conscious decision the very next day is to just return to the pattern that things were before, well, your mind is the ultimate, most powerful arbiter of what's going to happen. So no matter what type of a big breakthrough experience you might've had, if the next day you make the conscious, willful decision to just go straight into the old pattern, everything can just be like, shoop, right back to where it was. And maybe even more unstable than before because you've really damaged the foundation of those patterns, but you're still trying to stand on them. Agreed. Yeah, so that wasn't really a question. <laughs> but okay, let's wrap up hour one here. And uh, if you want to give out your email or hit them with the website one more time or anything you want to close with for the uh, the free hour people that you want to make sure that they know about, definitely no holds barred. You don't have to hurry, but uh, the floor is on you before we close it up. Yeah, so the URL to the website is integration-station.com. Also, if you just Google integration station, It'll pop up on the first page. It, the title is Psychedelic Integration. You can find it there. Or my email for the site is integration.station.us at gmail.com. Plenty of ways to find me. And you can also hit me up on Twitter. I'm pretty active there. It's My handle is Peter D. Conley. That's P-E-T-E-R-D, as in David, C-O-N-L-E-Y. Right on. Well, thanks for getting in touch and wanting to talk to me about this subject. And I look forward to going more deep in hour two with you, my man. Thanks for having me. The first hour flew by. That seemed like it was really quick. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, wrap it up. Everyone, you can catch hour two on Rockfin and Patreon. You know the drill. Thanks for making it to the end of another episode with me, everyone. I enjoyed this conversation with Peter about psychedelics. It is a topic that occasionally I'll bring up on the show. Maybe odd because I don't endorse them. (laughs) Probably would have in the past endorsed them in the sense of I recommend people try them. Now I'm not really on that team, although I'm more than willing to discuss them. It's more like I think everyone should make that decision for themselves. They should weigh the potential benefits against the difficulty of doing it correctly. And I say difficulty of doing it correctly, like, first of all, I like the idea of a clinical setting to use these plant medicines to a degree, but it's also like, who are you going to be going in with? Who's your guide or your guardian during that state? You got to make sure that you really trust that person. I would imagine you'd want several type of therapy sessions with an individual before you just jumped in to doing some kind of uh mind altering substance with them guiding you. And the other side of it is if you're going to do it outside of the clinical setting is you really have to be cautious about what you get knowing what it is. I think that's why psilocybin on the upside of things is probably the safest way to go. If you are looking to have a experience that you've never tried before in terms of psychedelic experience, but also just know that many people go their whole life without them and they're also okay. So I look at it almost like it's either A, a break glass in case of emergency type of thing, or B, it is you're very secure in yourself (laughs) and, or at the very least, you have very strong intentions on how you want to change yourself and you're ready to go deep. And that's, you know, That's on you to make that decision. That's why I don't endorse it, but I also don't say don't try it. I just want to be very neutral about this. Not to like cover my own self because I'm not worried about someone coming back and being like, you gave me shitty advice in your podcast and it ruined my life. I really don't expect that, but it is a personal decision and these are powerful tools. I do just see them as tools like any other tool could be used in a smart way or in a not smart way. Anyway, it sounds like Peter's got some very helpful things to offer people who are going to give these experiences a go. And like I said, in terms of doing it by yourself, like maybe the most important thing outside of mushrooms, because you would know what you're getting with mushrooms pretty obviously, is that anything that's like 
a refined substance, you need to make sure it's been tested and you know exactly what it is. Generally speaking, you got a random white powder. It could be a lot of stuff or it could be mixed with stuff. And I'm not here to be all like prophets of doom, but I have seen people doing stuff that they thought was one thing and then it got tested and it wasn't what they thought it was. And if it's a, a substance you've never tried before, it seems very easy for you to not even realize that the effects aren't what they're supposed to be. So anyway, be very cautious with all that stuff, but also don't be afraid. If you're going to go into it, just stay with your intentions rooted in why you're doing it and explore bravely. <laughs> uh, you know, psychedelic experiences have been a huge shape shaping component of me in my early 20s, mid 20s. And since I reached a certain level of, I don't know, change of changing myself, they haven't seemed that relevant for me to continue. They're actually, they actually became kind of difficult to use. As my energetic sensitivity expanded more and more, and uh, the other practices I was working on helped me find more clarity and the ability to sort of see myself and see within and be sensitive to energies around me more strongly, psychedelics became very potent, like a very small amount sent me over the edge, not over the edge, like I go crazy, but just like difficult, intense. And there's enough intensity in life and difficulty in life without me necessarily needing to add in the extra levels of challenge. But I guess I do still use cannabis pretty regularly. And uh, that is technically psychoactive. I mean, compared to what they used to have back in our parents' age, this, is this isn't even the same thing. It's a thousand times stronger. Well, uh, that's kind of maybe hyperbole, but it is way stronger. Maybe it is a thousand times stronger. I don't know. So yeah, uh, plus extension this episode. If you didn't catch that, it is on Rockfin and Patreon like normal. $5 a month for Patreon gets you the access to every plus extension of all time in the archive. And it's only five bucks. Go straight to me. Rockfin, you don't get the whole plus archive because I'm still working on adding shows to that. But there's some really good ones from 2020 already uploaded. And everything from this year in 2021 is on Rockfin. That's $10 a month, but you also get access to all the other channels on Rockfin. So you have two options. Both are going to be linked in the show description. And what else is there that I wanted to tell you about in this outro? Uh, well, there's good stuff coming up on the horizon. For people who are fans of Unslave podcast with Michael Tessarion and David Whitehead, I also returned to that show not long ago, and it's up on their website now where you can catch me talking about tuning and sound healing, vibrational healing modalities. What a good conversation that was. Michael knows a lot about somatic anatomy, <laughs> the body's intelligence, the way somatic interconnectivity, that's what I would say, sort of call it. All the different correlations between, say, like one spot on the ball of your foot to your kidneys, you know, Chinese medicine style, meridian style correlations. And he brought tons of insight to the presentation that I did over there. Really good conversation. I plan on at some point bringing that exact, I don't know if it's research, but just conversation to my own show, maybe in a solo show. People have told me lately I should do solo content, which is I don't know why it's scary to me. It's not that it's like I'm scared of it. It's just I'm hesitant because I'm so comfortable having one-on-one -on -one conversations. But here I am talking by myself right now for however long this will last. And I'm not running out of things to say. <laughs> so maybe it is something I should do. Also, if you watched the video version of this episode and you saw me hitting all those Kleenexes, I was having kind of an allergy thing. I found out a supplement that I was taking had lactose in it the whole time. <laughs> so that was silly. Uh, I thought it didn't. It was a type of cell salt, which is a interesting homeopathic thing that we're going to talk about in a future show, but hopefully I'll find a better source of them before that. <laughs> there I am sniffling right now. 
anyway, when I get dairy in my system, it hits me for like a month. I'll be over it soon. In the meantime, uh, you guys stay good out there. I'm going to play us out with a song by Quilla called It's Happening. And may all your psychedelic adventures, whether they involve substance use or not, bring your mind some more clarity and help you see yourself in a better light. It's been real. Love talking to you guys as always. Looking forward to the many good episodes coming up in the near future on my calendar. And we'll talk soon. Much love. Bye bye. Yeah. <laughs>